Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! The owner of Liberty Steel has said that none of its plants will close under his watch. There are 11 sites across the UK employing around 3,000 workers. Sanjeev Gupta said taking on the UK plants had been a tough journey and he's now racing to refinance his business after the collapse of his main financial backer. With more, here's our business editor, Simon Jack. Twelve steel plants across the UK are facing an uncertain future after the government rejected a request for a taxpayer bailout from the man once known as the saviour of steel. But today, Sanjeev Gupta was in defiant mood. It's still a tough journey ahead. UK has many disadvantages. UK steel industry has been decimated for the last few decades. We still have a lot of work to do. I'm not going to give up on the UK. As long as I'm in charge, my plants will stay open. But a lot of people think that um, with you in charge, that will be an impediment to government support. All our steel operations in the UK, one after another, was in the process of shutting. It's our hard work, which means the now high viable future. I believe in the future of my steel business. I, I'm guessing that you personally are worth 170 million. Why don't you put your own money in? I've always done, done so, and, and we're making I, some of that's happening as we speak. Gupta bought up plants that others had given up on, saving the livelihoods of workers who remain loyal to him. Sanjay has been a good, good employer as far as I'm concerned so far. We've had no problems with him. Wages are always regular. We're not missing dates. Everything seems to be all, no, not too bad. He says he's going to get through all this. But I hope he does. Gupta built his empire by using tomorrow's money to pay today's bills. He sold invoices due for future payment to a company run by this Australian banker, Lex Greensill, who would buy them at a discount for ready cash and sell them on to investors. But in early March, Greensill went bust, despite efforts from former Prime Minister and Greensill employee David Cameron, who personally lobbied the Chancellor on Greensill's behalf. Behind this unremarkable door is the London home of the remarkable middleman that funneled billions in investor cash into Mr Gupta's empire. Now, investors who got burnt when Greensill went bust are going directly after Mr Gupta's assets, surely making it harder for him to find the new money he needs to keep Liberty Steel afloat. The Prime Minister today insisted the UK needs strategic industries like steel. As we've learned during the pandemic that it's not a good idea uh, to be uh, you know, excessively reliant in, in, in times of trouble on, on imports for critical things. We saw that with PPE, for instance. So we're going to need a, a strong steel industry. Uh, I'm, I'm very hopeful that we'll get a, a solution. The finances are complicated, but simple industrial and political logic means the government is ready to intervene if necessary. Simon Jack, BBC News. Now, the owner of the UK's third largest steel producer, Liberty Steel, has admitted that he owes many billions of pounds to embattled finance company Greensill Capital. But Sanjeev Gupta has insisted that none of Liberty's plants will close while he remains in charge. It employs 5,000 people in plants in Glasgow, in South Wales and South Yorkshire. He denied reports that his company is on the brink of collapse, but said that he is seeking urgent financial support. Our economics correspondent, Heli Ibrahimi now reports. The man at the centre of the crisis. Sanjeev Gupta spoke today for the first time about the collapse of Greensill Capital and links to David Cameron and gave this promise. Under my watch, not a single steel plant I have in, in the UK will shut down. They have a future, they have a sound future. We have work to do still. I'm not saying it's a rosy, rosy road ahead. But with creditors circling, his position looks precarious. It's not all in your hands, is it? If we have to fight this... In the courts, we will. I'm hoping we won't have to, because by doing what they're doing, we're destroying value. Gupta's empire employs 5,000 people in the UK, many in northern Red Wall towns, where job prospects are slim without him. His empire was grown on the back of an aggressive acquisition spree funded by Lex Greensill, whose startup using supply chain finance had grand ambitions. This is how it works. After a company invoices its customers, they often have to wait 120 days to be paid. For small suppliers, this puts massive pressure on their working capital. Greensill wanted to be the middleman. He would give the suppliers cash early, but take a percentage cut for himself. Greensill then packaged these loans into products sold to other banks and pension funds. No
Feature kings came to visit. As the various tentacles of Gupta's empire grew with Greensill funding, but the close connections began to raise red flags and started a domino effect that culminated in Greensill Capital's collapse last month. What's going on with the friends of Sanjeev? Why are investors and regulators concerned about the connections within your company? Look, we've gone against the grain. What, what we started to do in 2013, nobody believed in. There were a lot and a lot of detractors. But for every detractor, I always tell my people that for every person who's a detractor, there's 10 supporters. Creditors are now chasing $5 billion owed by Gupta. A bailout request to government was rejected after the business minister said Gupta's companies were too opaque. You accept his criticism then? I don't see that as a criticism. What I believe is that we're on a journey. We're on a journey of successful family business, turning corporate, becoming more transparent. Gupta says it's actually years of government neglect that has left the steel industry ravaged. We need those jobs. We pay energy prices here three times what we pay in France. Policy in general in the UK, in my opinion, is still not favouring industry. Is it a failure of strategy? Yes, for the UK, for the last 30 years, it's a failure of strategy. The industry in the UK has been decimated. It used to be 30% of our GDP, it's less than 10% now. It's a complete failure of strategy. The crisis at Greensill has also turned a harsh spotlight on political connections. Greensill was connected to Jeremy Hayward, head of the Cabinet Office, through their banking days. David Cameron invited him into the heart of government. No formal job, but he got a security clearance, a desk and access to government departments. It's reported he bragged Cameron introduced him to President Obama, which opened the door to US expansion, void also by the kudos of having been awarded a CBE. Later, this man, Bill Crothers, who ran government procurement, was hired by Greensill. Also on the payroll was former Prime Minister, taking a whole bunch of share options. And what about Cameron's links to Gupta? You've said you've never met David Cameron. Is that true? You've never met him? No, not, not I, met, I, think I met him as Prime Minister, but I haven't met him since. But then later in the same interview... We, we, I mean, I'm, I, you know, I, I, I think David's a great man, but I've, I've not had the opportunity to meet him. Were you introduced to Lex by Jeremy Hayward? Um, no, I don't think so. It's hard to remember who you've met and who you've not met in such cosy circles. For Liberty's workforce, top of their mind will be how they keep their jobs. Helia Ibrahimi reporting. Well, joining me now to discuss this are two people who worked at the highest levels of government departments. Caroline Slowcock, a former private secretary to Margaret Thatcher and John Major, who is now director of the think tank Civil Exchange, and Sir Peter Westmacott, who is ambassador to the US, France and Turkey. Uh, welcome to you both. I mean, the questions raised by Helia's report are, will be alarming to many people watching tonight. So let me start by asking you, uh, Sir Peter. Now, is the revolving door between government and the private sector a spin cycle of potential corruption or a kind of legitimate way for ex-government officials to make a bit of money and cash in on their expertise and indeed their contacts? I think there's absolutely no problem about former civil servants, politicians, people who've worked in the public sector, uh, going to work in the private sector provided uh, they play by the rules and provided there is transparency. There is some criticism of the committee, which is called ACOBA, and forg forgive me if I've forgotten temporarily what the acronym stands for, which is an advisory committee uh, on appointments which people who've been in the public sector then take up in the private sector. And for a couple of years after you leave government, if you're a senior official or politician, you are encouraged, though I don't think there are any really sharp teeth requiring you to do this, uh, to ask for clearance. Right. before you go and work in the private sector, especially if you're going to take any money for it. OK, actually, our COBRA stands so, for... Sorry, it stands for the Advisory Committee on Business Appointments, and the chair of it is currently Eric Pickles, and he has said that in the last 30 years, there was not a single sanction issued against anyone by this particular committee, which almost defies belief, doesn't it, Peter? Well, it's, it's surprising in one sense, and I know that there have been some politicians who've simply ignored it. Uh, you will know who they are. The rest of us, most of the time, I would say, 
uh, whether it's an honor system or whether it's just that we come under pressure to, to play straight, we are pretty meticulous, uh, I certainly was, and everybody that I know was, about going to the committee, filling in the form, saying this is what we'd like to do, and when the approval comes through, which usually includes a certain provision that you do not undertake any lobbying, which is related to the job that you had had in the public sector before you retired from it. Right. So we've got a sort of revolving door, but we've also got some... Um, some, some guidelines, but you may be right in saying that they're not really tough rules. And clearly there have been occasions when people have gone into the private sector and used their former connections, their former positions, to do some pretty direct lobbying. Right. Have you done that? I mean, you were ambassador to the United States, to France and Turkey. Are you working in the private sector now? Yes, I am. And to what extent are you I using... Am. Right. And what are you doing? But my, the jobs that I... I mean, some of what I do is, is pro bono, working for think tanks and so on. Uh, but the, the work that I have got, which is on boards, is advisory. Um, I am not doing any lobbying. I am not doing any selling. I'm not, I'm not touting for business on behalf of any of the firms that I do. I sit on advisory boards um, of companies, some here, one or two in other countries. But I choose not to do any lobbying. And certainly all the jobs that I took in the first couple of years after I left the public sector were approved by the ACOPA committee. OK, Caroline Slowcock, I mean, what, what Sir Peter is doing is pretty common, especially amongst former ambassadors. Is the re so-called revolving door more common now than it was when you were working in government? Well, I think it probably is. Um, but it has been a, a phenomenon uh, over many years. And I think if you sort of step back away from the detailed rules and how they apply, you know, I think the truth of the matter is that money has a huge amount of influence over government and people are often recruited into, into business positions because of the contacts that they have. And this is, you know, in the case of David Cameron, you know, this has become very clear. The ability to text the current chancellor has been enormously important. So, you know, I would say that the rules are there, but are they really um, stopping that influence and that lobbying. Uh, we've got a, a register of lobbyists, but it doesn't capture the people mm. who are being paid inside organisations like Green Silk, um, who clearly are exercising influence, as David Cameron has been found to do. And I've got to ask you as well, have you been tempted to work in the private sector? Do you work in the private sector? No. Um, no, I've never been tempted to work in the private sector because the, the ethos, I don't want to, you know, obviously people will work, you know, it's, it's not a bad thing to work in mm. the private sector, but for me, the ethos of, of um, having been a civil servant means that I've been trying to pursue the public good through working, I've worked in charities, I've worked at the Equal Opportunities Commission, and now I, I, I lead a think tank, which is about how we, improving the way sure. that government works. And, and, you know, just briefly, and what needs to happen for regulation to be tightened up? I think we probably need to go back to, um, to looking at how well it's working, really sort of looking at the influence that's being exerted, mapping that influence. The current register isn't mapping all of that and just trying to make sure that it works properly. But I think there are, you know, also some, some questions about ethics for, for you know, prime ministers who've left office, uh, perhaps we need a code which applies, not just a set of rules, right. but a code of ethics. Uh, briefly to you, Sir Peter, do you think that David Cameron should be sanctioned? He's been cleared uh, on one level, but should he be sanctioned for what he's done? Briefly. Matt, I'm not going to comment on whether he should or should not. I simply don't know enough about the background to that story. Okay. Sir Peter Westmacott, uh, Caroline Slocal, thank you very much to both of you.